Okay. Hi, everyone. Just waiting for everyone to be let into the, the session. And I think everyone's in. So uh, welcome, everyone, to today's webinar, Red Team versus Blue Team, Experts Debate on Where the Industry is Going Wrong. Thanks a lot for joining us. I'm Tim Jones, the Managing Director of Hyperfire. I'll be your host today and the moderator of our debate. I'll now introduce our experts. On the red team, we have Alexi Dudkin, co-founder and offensive director at Volcus. Uh, by way of background, Alexi has been hacking things professionally for over 10 years. The spark occurred when he was six by hacking the memory of games to freeze the health points value. If only I could have done that. Now he hacks into his clients with permission, of course. Uh, who are organisations of all sizes, and he runs Volcus with Matt Strawn. Away from computer screens, he likes messing with cars. Uh, he likes adventures with his, his Siberian husky, who is called Volk, um, rock climbing, and, of course, long walks on the beach. Welcome, Alexi. Thanks for having me. Uh, and in the blue corner on the blue team, we have Stefan Prandl. Stefan is the CTO and co-founder of Hyperfire. As a former Curtin University PhD and lecturer in cybersecurity, and as an experienced threat hunter, Stefan has firsthand knowledge and understanding of the evolving threat landscape. When he's not writing code and staring at PCAP files, you can find him enjoying coffee with his wife, herding cats at home, or trying to explain to his non-technical friends what he actually does. Welcome, <laughs> Stefan. <laughs> yeah, hey. <laughs> All right, let's uh, let's launch straight into it. Um, first question for Alexi. Alexi, yeah. what does Red Team actually do? Yeah. Okay. Um, so, Red Team comes from uh, comes from the military exercise of offense versus defense. So, in a Red Team engagement, we would typically use. Uh, similar techniques to real world adversaries, real world hackers, attackers, people that are interested in getting into organizations or achieving their goal, whatever it may be. We're using those same tactics to break into our clients' businesses so that they can see exactly what their adversaries would do. It's um, playing devil's advocate, so to speak. Um, the common question I get asked is, what's the difference between that and penetration testing? And really the difference is in the goals. So with a penetration test, our goal is to find as many vulnerabilities as possible. It's really not to stay stealthy or not get caught or anything like that. With a red team, however, our goal is to cause some business impact. It's usually not technical. It's not like get domain admin or, or do that. It's get our source code, shut down the refinery, manipulate our stocks. It's stuff that's actual real world business impact, the stuff that attackers would do if they were to target that particular organization. Great, thanks for that. And Stefan uh, from the blue corner, what does the blue team actually do? Yeah, so um, the funny thing about the blue team is it's sort of defined in complement to the red team because obviously the red team name comes from you know, this military operations sort of a uh, war gaming exercises sort of things. But um, obviously, if you've defined the red team, well, whatever's left is what the blue team's up to. So realistically, the blue team are the guys that uh, architect, design, implement, maintain, monitor uh, your defensive systems. So if you've got a security team you've currently got on hand, technically, unless they're a bunch of penetration testers, they're your blue team. Right. If you've got guys sitting in your sock watching the monitors, you've got engineers from security engineers watching those monitors they're part of the blue team and that is definitely probably the more you know broad base of the blue team is just guys watching uh, eyes on glass socks uh but the more like advanced cool sort of stuff are like threat intelligence engineers guys that are like you know figuring out what the bad guys are up to on the dark net um you know and uh you know incident response technicians who go in you know after the bad guys have come in or even during when the bad guys have come in and then try to you know a stop them b figure out what they did and then see, stop them from doing that again. Cool. Thanks, Devin. Um, back to you, Alexi. What approaches and tools do Red Team typically use, or, and specifically your Red Team? Yeah, so no two Red Teams are the same. Um, Every one that we design is very much in tandem with our clients and their specific needs. Typically speaking, 
a red team is as close to a real world hack as you can get without being arrested um, or without actually being attacked. Uh, so we will, you know, we will start by doing a lot of reconnaissance, uh, figure out who we're targeting, why we're targeting them, what we're trying to do, how can we get in, what's the best approach here. And we come up with things called camp, what we call campaigns. And a campaign can be complex or, or simple, but a campaign is essentially just something that we can try. And uh, we always weigh up what are the rewards versus the risks? How much more access or how much closer to our goal are we likely to get versus how likely are we to get caught by doing it? So something really loud like a, um, a brute force attack, let's say, against a login page, right? Trying a bunch of usernames and passwords. That's quite a loud attack. We're probably going to get caught. Um, so we might put that down on a lower priority list. But we'll try any anything goes really in the best red teams is we can try and break in physically to their office. We can try and do social engineering either via phishing emails or calling people directly. Um, you know, I always say, who cares if you can break into the most secure system in the world? If you can call up the right person and go, hey, just give me access to your data. And that happens. It doesn't matter if, if that was done through like cyber or not cyber, right? That's yeah, like you the impact the your business right? is it's the like same. Who cares? <laughs> yeah, that's right. Um, but then obviously diving into the more technical aspect, we're looking for actual vulnerabilities in systems that'll progress our goals. At some point, everyone's data is on a computer somewhere, so we're all, almost always going into that realm. Um, but yeah, we're we're lock picking our way in. Like I've got a set of lock picks here. I don't know if you can see that. Cool. Set of lock set of lock picks, set of uh elevator keys. I know Wizzy's in chat or in, in the call. Thanks, Wizzy, for these. I know I got, <laughs> got the idea from from you. These are awesome. They basically bypass any access controls in elevators. Um and this one, for example, like we've got this guy, which is basically a card reader. Um, those are RFID cards that you use to badge in. We can clone a lot of those. And that's just a small one. But wow. we also carry like a massive one for long range reading. So it's not like you would have seen in those cringy, I don't know, maybe some cringy TV shows where like you're going right up to someone's bum, almost grabbing it. You don't need to do that. You just stand at about a meter away with these long range reader, I just walk past the person and um, hopefully pick up a card. Last thing I'll kind of show, this looks like a normal USB cable, right? Well, in there's a mini computer. That's a little little uh, wireless uh, computer in there. I can plug that into a computer and have remote access to that computer. Just a couple of tools that we use for the more physical side of things, which is always a bit more fun, interesting, I think, the stories, yeah. Yeah, yeah, that, that's, uh, that's interesting. I, I always forget the physical side of what Red Team does. We always think that, you know, people are busting in through the, you know, through the web and whatever, but uh, physical is just as important. Man, um, props for the OMG cable there, love it. <laughs> yeah, <geez. laughs> yeah, we had two guys um, try and go full glowy brain, right? Try and clone the card and break in that way like literally recently i think this week or last week we had an engagement similar to that and the card didn't work for some reason they walked in with confidence put the card on the radar it beeped the door didn't open and the receptionist was like oh do you need some help with that and they're just like oh that's weird it worked yesterday and they just got let in <laughs> and it's like that's awesome all that work we could have literally classic. used any card why did we bother trying to clone anything it's just yeah it's funny like that sometimes always, down to always weakest link yeah. <laughs> well how about you Stefan? how about uh blue team what kind of approaches is blue team using 
oh god blue team blue team's a nightmare world um because you know while while the uh, the the common thing is is that while red team only has to win once blue team has to win every single time right and there are so many entertaining ways that red team can get into any single system like and we're not just talking about you know the good guys red teaming you know we we like it if Volkers gets into a system you know at least then we know it's it's when they happen to be you know a bunch of guys from russia who you know want to stage an attack on ukraine or something from you know your print server or something um that's that's side to that is if i can interject (laughs) the flip side to that is for us you only have to catch us once but we have to stay evasive at every step and if we Mm. stumble at any of those steps we're screwed as well so yeah assuming assuming you have a reasonably good blue team on the other side (laughs) yeah yeah no no uh so there's there's a there's a broad sort of uh you know array of things that blue team sort of sits in on and you know deals with right uh everything from user training which is supposed to deal with people and go oh the card isn't working no i'll just let them through it's like stop letting people do that um but you know humans don't know right we trust people so that's one thing we've got to work around and that's very very hard because that's kind of a fundamental human thing uh in more technical terms uh you know generally what you've got uh inside a blue team sort of a set of systems is you've got things that collect data and things that help with analysis of data and those things that collect data can be you know everything from your cool edr systems sitting on laptops ndr systems which is what we do at hyperfly sitting on networks uh firewalls uh you know vulnerability scanners that some automate some part of uh, detecting vulnerabilities inside networks. Of course, you know, the reason you want a pen test team even on top of that is because you can never guess what the human's going to actually do. Uh, you know, but you've got all these different bits and pieces. You'll have things that are connected into your SaaS stuff. So you've got Office 365 at home uh, or, or in your current work, uh, you know, pull all of the log data out of that. You can tell what people have been doing. Uh, and then you want to bring that all back to something or a couple of things that actually allow you to actually perform analysis, build rule sets, build playbooks on top of that, and actually have ways of responding to or identifying and then responding to stuff that you actually detect. Uh, It's a lot less, you know, uh, flashy. You know, we don't generally have a whole bunch of really cool little toolkits to play with in terms of like physical stuff. Uh, And it is a lot more you sit in one place and you you sit around and do stuff. Um, That said, the really cool stuff comes in when you've got proper threat hunting going on. Uh, if you want to do, uh, say, you know, validate that your systems can detect certain kinds of attacks, you kind of have to emulate them. And so that's when you start getting the blue team cracking out some of the red team's tools. So we'll pull out things like, you know, your software, uh, you know, toolkits to, uh, you know, basically run limited engagements inside a friendly network uh, with the express intent of creating the circumstances that we're looking for in to make sure that we can actually detect stuff. Uh, so, you know, you know, it's not just the red team going around trying to break into stuff. Sometimes the blue team themselves are really often at the moment because that's still pretty on the edge of the extreme of blue teams. But it is something the blue team does and should be doing. Okay. So yeah, broad broad set of tools, broad set of tools, a bunch of whole bunch of random stuff, a lot more monitoring, you know, as you'd expect from like a you know an actual security security team just with cyber stuff. It's really cool okay. seeing that from our side as well, though. Like we. At the end of any red team engagement that we do, like we do a two hour workshop with the blue team in the same room where we kind of go like, this is what we did versus this is what the blue team saw, right? And just following the breadcrumbs, seeing them follow the breadcrumbs that we've left behind potentially is really cool. It's like, wow, I thought I was, I thought I was really safe here, but like you've got like like, (laughs) locked from here to here. Yeah, you might have lost me from you know, in between this server and that server or wherever. But yeah, like the granularity that I've seen come out of some of these reports, it's like at Mm. 1037, this happened. And I'm like, I yeah, I guess. I think I did that at that exact time. Yeah. Yeah. It's really interesting how much of this information persists and how long it can persist for if things Mm. are set up properly. Like, you know, uh, we I remember doing incident response reports where it's like the events happened three months ago, but because they're stored on a server somewhere, you can go back in time and look at the exact events that happened in what order. So, you know, down to you can see when someone logged in, when they failed logging in, when they actually succeeded logging in, what files they opened, what emails they looked 
looked at when they looked at emails, when they actually clicked on reply, you know, when they then mm-hmm. typed on and then moved to another email because they actually wanted to check to see if what they were trying to spoof was, you know, it's like all of this stuff is just like really, really, uh, you know, cool. And I think it's uh, really neat that, uh, you know, we actually have this information and also um, something people should be aware of that, you know, if, if you do have, you know, someone actually, you know, maintaining a security presence or capability at your uh, at your place of work, they probably have all that information on what you do at the workplace. So, you know, there's that sort of stuff's kept for quite a while. Um, yeah, no, uh, one of the my favorite things about, you know, especially the the much more investigative and incident sort of side of Blue Team is that, you know, if you watch uh you know uh what real crime or you know mystery thriller sort of stuff it, it's it's very much that kind of discovery process just in the real world because there's like nothing is absolutely clear it's all you know trace material and trace uh stuff that you're seeing and you're putting it together to try and build a narrative so it's it's really really neat and a lot of fun to do and you, you do get these like aha moments where you go oh wait that's what they use so yeah, it's it's not like you're sitting around doing boring stuff. I mean, that, that does happen, but you know, there there are a lot of uh, very entertaining uh, parts of Blue Team itself. So interesting. Just uh, I guess along those lines, I'm going to throw a sort of topical subject at at the two of you, Alexi. What are your thoughts on uh, open source offensive tooling? Yeah. Okay. Um, this is it's the age old question, right? Of is it doing more harm or more good by open sourcing offensive tooling and proof of concepts and exploits and stuff like that? Look, I guess I'm a little bit biased because I'm on the offensive (laughs) security side, but I'm on this side for a reason. And we can do what we do because of the people that release this open source stuff. In my mind, the more information that's out there, the more blue teams have um, foreknowledge so they know to expect these sorts of things, right? I think it's a little bit naive to think that if there are no open source projects or no open source tooling, that there just won't be any attacks. Of course, the bad guys are going to create their own, of course, right? The other sort of unintended consequence might be that now penetration testing is 10 times more expensive every time because we have to come up with our own offensive tooling that we can't open source. We can't share with anyone else if we're just saying that's not allowed. Um, So we have to build our own and everyone just basically has their own, right? uh, I'm a big believer in there's no such thing as bad shared knowledge. Sharing knowledge is always a positive thing, in my opinion. And this is just part of that. So we all learn together. We all learn about what kind of attacks are possible through these open source projects and public tooling. Um, It allows us to be better. It allows us, the red team, to be better. And I think it also allows the blue team to be better because, yeah, all the cards are on the table face up Mm. right we can see what they do they can see what we do or potentially what tooling we use would you rather be defending against something like cobalt strike which is good at what it does but you know what cobalt strike is Uh versus something just as capable that you've never seen before Mm. so yeah yeah i mean like from my perspective I, i remember um way back when when edward snowden dropped the uh dropped his leaks that he did uh i remember there was a group of guys uh you know tangentially to the security community who were like man this is really bad now everyone's going to encrypt everything and we're not going to be able to see what's going on right he he shouldn't have done that he should not have uh you know shared these state secrets blah 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 and i mean you know depending on what part of the intelligence uh, community you're part of there are some you know reasonable reasons to not like the idea of people just whistleblowing intelligence secrets but on the other hand right uh knowing what people what what the other side is capable of allows you to actually have the intelligence on those capabilities in the first place but not knowing that stuff uh not knowing especially exploits well you know wanna cry right wanna cry was based on the eternal blue exploit and double pulsar in some cases right these were toolkits built and maintained by the us nsa uh you know specifically to allow them to get into windows machines that no one else could use 
right? So it doesn't even protect you from, you know, attacks if people don't know about this. All it means is that people with money and power will be able to abuse that. And that is the worst scenario you want because then those people can decide who has access to systems. So yeah, you're never going to know what these things look like. And also, uh, you know, even, even, gr even groups of people that you think would work in our better interest can then abuse those powers for their own uh, ends. So, you know, from, from just a, from just a, what do you want as a citizen sort of thing? It's like, yeah, you want this stuff to be as open as possible. You want it open as soon as possible, mm -hmm. even if that's going to have impact on organizations, because well, at least then everyone knows. And from blue team, right. Actually knowing what these things look like. Oh, it's super useful. Right. I know that anytime you get yourself a little, you know, proof of concept exploit, the amount of attackers that just pick up that proof of concept and yeah. throw it at every server in existence. <laughs> yeah. Incredible. It's yeah. like, there's so many people who are just like, oh yeah, I know how to use uh, a script. I can run Python on my Ubuntu box, you know, like your master hacker sort of hacker yep. 101 sort of people. Uh, they will run these things, which means is if you know what that proof of concept looks like, you can defend against, you know, mm -hmm. broad swaths of attacks, but you can also then build like, especially if it's like a, a you know, specific piece of code, you know, an actual uh, exploit application, you can actually build uh, rules for your detection systems, right? You can build Yarrow rules based on that. You have one guy that's pretty good at, uh, you know, breaking down uh, software, you can build those rules. And because, you know, sharing is caring, right? If someone in some other organization, say, I don't know, CrowdStrike comes up with something like that and shares, hey guys, this is the Yarrow rule that'll find this crazy piece of code, like regardless of what piece of software it's embedded in, congratulations you can now strap this to whatever toolkit you have. And now that's within your detection capability. This doesn't happen yeah. if everyone's sitting there trying to, you know, hoard all of the exploits they know about and what they can steal off the attackers they get hit by, right? So yeah, at the moment, we're not all the way there. Like I think in like the pure security circles, like regardless of which team you're on, we know that if we all know, then no one can really, uh, you know, abuse that. Uh, even though, if even if you know that an exploit is still used, that doesn't mean you can actually detect it yet. You, you know that you that's a target that you might want to care about. Um, but we know that you know the the intelligence sharing is paramount to everyone's safety. And uh, you know, outside of that community, uh, there's still people who are like, oh, well, why would we report this? Why would we tell people about this? It's like, mm. yeah, I know that you might feel awkward or it might be embarrassing if you've been hit by something uh, or you may think that it's uh, a better thing if only people that are responsible have access to these tools uh, but realistically all that does is it results in negative outcomes for everyone and everything yeah the only sort of nuance to all of this i feel is just dropping devastating zero days mm. right like if you don't give vendors the chance to actually fix it like a yeah. fair chance I don't, yeah, I, I don't agree in like yeah, more no. than 90 days. Like 90 days is more than enough. Mm. A lot of these vendors, it's like you've made decent <laughs> money for the Intel software you've sold. Lead. It's <laughs> just fix it. Just fix it. Right. Yeah. yeah. No. Um, Put it a priority. Like, like but the, like, the, the, yeah. yeah. The, two, the two examples being, you know, uh, anything to do with uh, Spectre and Meltdown. That was a really good example of actually giving people lead time. Mm. Uh, the other side of this is, is anyone, if anyone remembers the Sandbox Escaper um, Zero Days dropped on Microsoft, yeah, uh, where, yeah. Where, where Microsoft did a bad and then a certain person uh, who, who now I think actually got hired by Microsoft. Yeah, eventually. they did get hired by yeah. Microsoft. Um, yeah. Yeah, just, just, and this is not a promotion for doing that. That was done, you know, because they realized they'd done a bad. Um, this person just dropped zero days on Twitter. Yeah. So, you know, now, now it's like, oh, Microsoft has as much notice as the attacker guys. And at least the attacker guys have a proof of concept now, right? They're ahead of anyone that's trying to defend. So it was, it was not a good example. So yeah, if, if you are out there doing security research, uh, you know, uh, caring about you know being responsible about your uh, vulnerability uh you know um reveals if you will uh is is kind of important and i think everyone's most people have got that now mm. uh you know even though there are still companies out there like zerodium that are somehow still making money <laughs> they're making money because your you you literally will get more money for your zero days on the black market than you will from the vendor mm. like that's that's just the way it is right now like there are people willing to pay you way way more money than the actual vendor of the software products and mm. so even and so zerodium you know obviously i think they don't sell that stuff on the black market i'm pretty sure they don't but there are organizations 
that will pay for that and pay more money than the actual vendor. Just to put that into perspective, yeah. like they care about their security so much that they're willing to pay more than what the vendor's willing to offer you for their for their own protection. Um, in your opinion, how much time should security researchers give vendors to fix stuff? Let's say it's a critical. Let's let's go like it's oh, an eternal blue level vulnerability, right? Yeah. How, what's in your opinion, what's the appropriate amount of time? Uh, look, I think I think the I think the default is usually like, you know, okay, guys, you've got like two ish months at most. Sixty days is about right. Okay. Um, because I mean, you know, knowing knowing on the dev side what's possible, if people are actually told, hey, this needs to be fixed, you can you can bug fix and have something out in like two weeks. So, you know, even if this is like an insanely complicated operating system like Windows, right? Mm. If Microsoft actually wanted, they could get this fixed. Right. Um, they just don't. They don't they don't care as much realistically. They 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 know who they need to support and how they need to support them. And everyone else is just kind of the also ran. So um, you know, as far as I know, anyway, uh the the problem becomes that may need to be shortened significantly if it is currently being used in the wild. Uh, you know, it might not be used by everyone in the wild yet. So releasing it may cause, you know, more people to use it. But if you've got known actors, like, you know, when when you had the Hafnium stuff going on, if you've got known actors out there using you know, proxy logon, then yep. proxy logon needs to be fixed real fast. And if uh, you guys aren't going to be able to fix it within, say, you know, a couple of weeks, well, everyone needs to know because they're potentially a target, right? So there's, there's a direct time pressure based on whether or not people are using it. If you found a zero day and no one's used it the only thing you can say is is that because we tend to find it at the same sort of time you know people will find these exploits at a roughly yeah. the same sort of time not really sure what causes that effect i'm not sure if people you know really have any idea but all you can say is that if you're the first person to find it it's likely that someone else and that person might not be as good has either just found it or is about to find it yep. so you want to keep it pretty quick yeah. um but yeah, if, if someone's using it, it becomes a, all right, guys, you, you move this along because there's people at risk. And if I tell them how this thing works, they can actually at least defend themselves. Yep. So should cool. vendors be paying more for these kind of things? <laughs> um, generally, yeah. Um, I, I don't like the idea of playing a paying versus paying thing because, uh, you know, if you do that, you just end up escalating the amounts because, you know, it just becomes like ransoms, right? You know, if I've got the tool that'll break your stuff, well, now I'm going to pay you more because they're paying you more and then you've got to beat them and now you're just playing a bidding war. Um, the problem is, is that I'm not entirely sure that we have, inter well, we definitely don't, I mean, ransomware is a thing. We don't have international tools to actually, you know, target the organizations that are doing it for ill, all right? Uh, you know, heck, you know, Revil was taken out only after immense pressure from the US government. And I don't think the Russians would do that today. So, you know... We, we, we just don't have the capability to make these people, you know, do the right thing. We can't enforce any sort of, uh, you know, policy on how these things should be used. So at the moment, it's uh, you got to pay whatever you can, right? Uh, and you've got to also hope that the guy that actually has the exploit cares about something a bit more than just money. So, you know, that that that's also a tricky bit. Like, you know... That's what it comes down to, though, right? Yeah. And it's... It's, if you're it's not good. Entice... It's not good. <laughs> So the okay, so the people that are on the good side and do responsible disclosure and all that, they're not they're not gonna drop the vuln unless they've been really screwed over by the vendor, right? Like I've seen people really screwed over by the vendor and they threw their hands up in the air and went, forget about it. I've tried, I'm just gonna drop it on Twitter, whatever. Right. That's really the only way to turn people that have good intentions. So then the vendors are targeting the ones with neutral or potentially bad intentions, right? They're finding these vulnerabilities or, and developing exploits to, to, to use them for nefarious purposes, right? How do we swing those people in order to disclose these vulnerabilities to the vendor? Well, yeah, I mean, money is the way to do it if they're not going to do it, like they're not going to do it out of the goodness of their heart. So it needs to be something else, right? Either a threat of legal action. Good luck. If you're in Russia or China, good luck. <laughs> um, and really the only thing left then is, is money. So if they can be enticed to 
disclosing it to the vendor because it's in their own best interest as well, then that's the best way to do it. Um, it's like, I'm not going to name names, but we as Volcus pay more money in our bug bounty program than some of organizations, than some other organizations in the Forbes 500. Okay. Like there are organizations in the Forbes 500 that pay less than us for vulnerabilities. And that's just not on. Like, <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, mm. if you really care about having people disclose your own problems to you in a responsible way, you've got to give them a reason to do that. Um, yeah. Yeah. Like, it's fun for people to go hacking. That's fun, of course. But it's there time, is a point, right? There is a it's, point it's where time. it's like, my time's yeah. worth more than this. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah, it's like, you know, you've got people, these people aren't just like, generally speaking, aren't just tripping over these things, right? They're not just jumping on a website and going, whoa, I've managed to score yeah. root access to your web server. They're, they're spending an enormous amount of time, like weaseling their way past, like, in some cases, like some of the exploits that I've seen are just hilarious. Like there is an off by one error in one input buffer. So if I constantly keep it input that let me just slide an executable via this one, you know, thing, I can actually eventually execute it. It's like, that takes a long time to figure out, right? And they're not, they're going to go, I've spent, you know, the last, what, three, four days, heck, three, four weeks of time, you know, weaseling my way past this thing. And I've got something that works, right? The amount of money that they are, you know, that, that, that exploit is worth is at least the amount of time that they've spent. So, you know, if, if you're going to rock up as like, again, a Forbes 500 company and go, yeah, here's 200 bucks, thanks, bye, right? They're not going to do that for very long. Yeah, no. It's yeah, like it's either it's either they've spent the ones that are successful, they're either super narrow focused or super broad focused. They choose to either look at one thing and look at it for years and years and continue to find issues with it, or they scan the entire internet for like a few classes of vulnerabilities, doing manual investigation, looking for those like quote unquote easy to mm. find vulnerabilities. But regardless, you're spending a lot of time. So either you're doing volume or you're doing precision but regardless of what you're doing it's still a significant time investment in order to be Mm -hmm. successful at it yeah okay interesting um yeah this is this is all interesting stuff but this is a debate and i feel like you guys are agreeing too much so i'm going to change (laughs) all right Uh, let's go alexi what's blue team doing wrong Ooh. oh okay um what what are kind of common common mistakes that you know maybe you'd you're just sort of seeing regularly sort of saying, I wish these guys would just, you know, just get this, this basic thing sorted. Blue team specifically, I'm sort of using the broad term of blue team in all Go types of like. defenders. Yeah. Like, yeah. like not, not specifically like the people at socks and, and, the, yeah. and incident responders, but more the broad term, the basics still work. Right. So finding, finding, weak passwords is still probably one of the best ways in. Um, Limiting scope can be frustrating as well. So when we do, when we do red team engagements, we want to emulate or simulate, sorry, the attackers as closely as possible. Real world attackers do not give a shit about your scope. They don't give a shit about your policies. They will do whatever they want. So if that's the goal of this engagement, let us do whatever we want, right? Let us target people specifically. Let us target C-level execs, which some, yeah, fairly often they're like, yeah, you can target everyone except for the C-suite board. And I'm like, but that's exactly who we want to target. Um, yeah. So yeah, it, getting, getting the basics right. Patching is still obviously a big problem getting basic configurations right. But also I think for some of the less mature organizations, unfortunately they get sucked into a way of thinking of, we need to buy the next best shiny product rather than taking a human approach to it. Um, And yeah, it's like, well, congratulations. You've got a triple plus DLP TM copyright patent pending. But have you taken the time to actually classify your data or have some human input into this and seeing, 
well, let's see what our let's see what our employees are currently doing with this. Like before we even think about it, first of all, what problems are we trying to solve? Is this the best way to do it? Is this the most the most cost effective way to do it? And if the answer is yes, um, how much maintenance does this require? How much human effort does this require to maintain? Because you know, your data today is going to be very different to the types of data you have in a year's time, probably, right? So yeah, I, I feel like that's the biggest issue is that you got to at some point realize that the attacks that are going to work against you are human driven attacks and you're not going to be able to solve a, a human attack or you're not going to be able to prevent a human attacker with automated tooling or with just your next shiny firewall right next gen next gen next next gen firewall yeah okay cool um stefan any any uh views on that Oh man, um, the the one thing I'll put on that is that uh, very often, and I'm pretty sure uh, you know a decent chunk of the blue teeny dudes that you know, are either on this webinar, we'll see it at some point. I uh, would agree that you know it's not necessarily the blue team guys themselves that yeah. are limiting scope to stuff. Um, you know, generally speaking, we're well aware of the limitations imposed by the business. And I think that's the problem. Like the core problem is, is that the business decision-making mechanism is very much, hey, what is the cheapest way that we can just solve this cost of business? And it's like, technically the cheapest way is probably just to get a bunch of analysts that, you know, know what they're doing. Some engineers that actually can build some tools and then just telling them build an open source monitoring toolkit, right? It'll take them a ton of time. Mm -hmm. But it'll be bespoke for your for your for your operations, right? It'll be really, really effective. Um, the problem is, is that you know people will look at HR costs at the moment and just go, Whoa. and so they go, how can we offload that somewhere? And as soon as you do that, you're looking at solutions based uh, thinking. And as soon as you're in solutions based thinking, the checklist comes out. And oh my god, are so many vendor companies, you know, just super fans of just jumping on board that because they'll just be like, hey. You need an XDR. What's an XDR? We're not even sure, but have one, right? And it's like, unless you have people that know how to use it behind the thing, it's it's just a really, really shiny, cool, you know, gamer front end, right? It'll, it'll tell you there's five gamers on your network, but it won't tell you anything useful, right? Um, you know, and, and this is this is sort of the issue. It's like, you know, we, we sit in, the longer you sit in blue team land, the more you see of this and the more it just becomes like a, you either agree that, oh, well, the best way to make money is to just play into this. Or you kind of go, how on earth do I convince these people that have no idea of what's actually going on, that they need to think about this just a little bit better, you know, like they need, they need to think about, you know, maybe it's not uh, a goal, it's a process, right? Uh, maybe, so was, maybe it's, yeah. yeah. Where's the disconnect then? So, okay, you, you talked about like you've got your decision makers and then you've got the people on the ground doing the actual defense, right? At, at some point in that hierarchy, if they've got a SOC or they've got a team doing this already, surely they've got at least a SOC lead, right? Or a SISO or someone who's got enough knowledge to be able to bring up this issue but also enough sway to be able to convince the right well, I people think, I like think that's the issue the it's like yeah. it's the the issue is is you know if there is a you know senior who knows what the issue is mm. they don't have the sway right okay. they don't have the at the moment right uh mm. they don't have the uh clout to actually pull that off right their their thing is it's like you know the people above them the processes above them are very uh, old, right? They're, they're, they're older than say tech, right? They're not designed to deal with these. Again, if you're, a, if you're a fridge manufacturing company, at no point has your business ever had to consider like full tilt cross organization security. Yeah. Right? At worst, <laughs> yeah. it's been that factory needs a security guard, right? Yeah. It's, it's, it's never been, hey, security the guy's cameras. in accounting. Yeah. Or they've got to really consider like all of the security implications that otherwise, you know, the security guard is doing, right? They, they, that that viewpoint is tricky to get across. And I think the issue is, is that at the top of a lot of these organizations, we're only like just getting to the point where people are starting to go, 
oh, maybe we should do that. And like, you know, some of the, you know, like the us, you know, the sort of cyber experts, we're only just getting to that sort of level that we can actually go, hey guys, you know, we're, we're COO of this organization. I have some, you know, IT experience. Maybe you all should be listening to the tech dudes a bit more, you know, otherwise they're yeah. just considered to be a bunch of, you know, techies, you know, they, yeah, okay. They want the cool idea. They want to do this and that and the other, but that's all too expensive and it doesn't have any impact on our bottom line. You know, it just means we end up spending more money. Let's not do that. Um, but that's the thing, right? Uh, I know that in like other countries, other, other, other like broad cybersecurity or like markets, right? Um, there are major changes happening where people are going, oh, actually, no, the, 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 you know, the CRO or the CISO is coming up to the board and saying, hey, this is where we are. This is where we need to be. And this is why. And the board's going, yep, cool. That's not so much happened here yet. And it doesn't happen all the way around the world yet. And I can imagine there's quite a few countries that are still like getting into tech. And that's not going to happen for quite some time. So we're all in this like, the, the worst bit is, is that it doesn't matter where you are, you're still like completely vulnerable to these kinds of attacks anyway, because the internet's just global. So it, it really sucks that, you know, we're in this vastly different uh, sort of, uh, you know, uh, ability to communicate, right, it, it, throughout an organization, right? You've got organizations that are really well doing doing this really well, actually bringing that insight into the uh, top levels of, of um, decision making. And then you've got organizations that haven't even considered yet, and they're all vulnerable to the same level of attack. It's not like, you know, as, as your game progresses, it gets harder. It's like, no, yeah. as the best player in the game progresses, everyone ends up with that difficulty. Yeah. It's interesting to think about this from the other side, though, right? Like, just to put some empathy into it and going... Like, I, I feel like we, both of us, both of like both sides, like red team, blue team, that's like, at, well, at what point do we go, okay, it seems like we haven't done a very good job at explaining this because mm. I feel like if we had done a good job, then there would be a bit more effort at, in, yeah, in, this, yeah. in, this, in this area, right? It's like, yeah. If no. if we tr can truly show that, I mean, which which is why we do red team in the first place. If we yeah, can show exactly this right. is there's no there's no ifs and buts here. We literally did this, and if we can do it, someone else can do it. Mm. And at that point, I start to see eyes sort of opening up and going, "Oh, okay." <laughs> um, but as as an industry, I feel like we suck at going from. I got domain admin or I got access to this server to what does that actually mean for, for that business, right? In your fridge example, well, what that means is I can push that button and suddenly your assembly line for fridges stops. That's what that means, right? Mm -hmm. And that gap, I feel, is very still very poorly addressed. Like yeah. a lot of things that I read stop at I own server, I got shell. Yeah, yeah. So it, there's there's so a story what? after that, right? Yeah. I, I actually feel like this is like beyond just a, you know, security issue. This is like a broad cultural problem with regards to our relation to, you know, tech in general, right? Yeah. Uh, it's like hands up if you have a TikTok, right? Do, do you consider what the consequences of you giving the information that TikTok harvests off your devices and off of you, uh, what, what that means? I mean, you know, currently in America, there, there's a whole movement to pull people off period applications because they're concerned that what's going to happen is bounty hunters are going to use the data they can buy off the companies that maintain those applications to hunt down people that were pregnant and now aren't, right? Mm. That's horrifying. That and horrifying. no one had considered, no one had disgusting. considered it up until yeah. this point, yep. right? It's like, we do not think about that as a society broadly. And the ones of us that do are in this chat, right? We're, we're the sort of people that are doing that. We sit around and we go, should we get a Google speaker system? Where can I put that? Does it actually, you know, is, it, is there any consequences to me putting it in the bedroom, for example? Probably shouldn't put it there. But most people don't have that level of thought. They, they, they don't understand the consequences and the capabilities of tech in general. And I yeah. think that is the underlying problem that brings forth this next level of, okay, when you actually get to the business decisions level, when you hear things like someone say, we need to have these technologies, otherwise someone can just turn off our refrigerative, uh, refrigerative plant, you know, unless they have someone rock up and actually demonstrate that to them, they go, nah, that's ridiculous. No way could that possibly happen. You know, it just yeah. seems like science fiction. 
Yeah. And, you know, I, I'm not sure where we get to with actually working on that. I think we're doing an okay-ish job. We need to target it a bit better, but this is like a real education, like a level of like the issue at like all levels. Like we we, we need, we're, we're doing an okay job, at least in organizations, because we're bringing things around slowly, but surely, right? Yeah. Um, but like, this needs to be broader. It needs to be, you know, kids need to learn this sort of thing at some point someone needs to have a class in high school which is like all right this is your relationship with the internet this is how it works these are how computers work so that phone thing that you got from your parents here are the things you got to deal with like i don't know where that really comes down to because it's like it's a hard problem to solve but that's kind of what i see is like the underlying issue that drives all of this disconnect in the first place so guys, yeah. just just before uh, I ask my next question, I'm just going to um, flag to to the audience that it's almost uh, audience question time. So uh, mm. feel free to to bang up some questions in the in the chat, um, and I'll ask the guys uh, those in a sec. Um, just coming back to the the conversation, so um, it seems like there are a few issues that you guys have thrown up in terms of this disconnect between you know, red team, blue team, uh, defenders, uh, and I guess decision makers, um, is, uh, what, what's, what, what do you think is the common language, uh, in terms of how everyone can communicate and understand each other? Is it, is it simply risk? Is it, is it, you know, pegging the risk of, you know, these security issues to organizational risk? Uh, is it culture? Uh, is it something else? Yeah, no, I I think it, I think it's always going to start with empathy. Um, we are, as as techies, we are very good at black and white or or perfectionist thinking. You should be doing this full stop. Why? Why should we be doing this, right? I think if we can have a bit of empathy to someone who isn't in this world, uh, they're not seeing this every day. Like we take this for granted that we see this every day that we know not to put Google speakers around, around the place, even though I've got one right there. Um, <laughs> it's, 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 you know what hey, I mean? Look, like I've, got, I've got a phone, right? <laughs> Siri is doing the same thing. <laughs> they just don't think about it. And a lot of the ego needs to come out of the way we talk about it right it it needs to not be a conversation of oh my god why are you doing that don't you know that google's listening to you it's like oh well that that's that's the wrong way to go about it i think is that that's you know instantly the other person is going to feel like they're stupid they've made a mistake they're going to want to just defend their position right oh well i did it because i i don't care i got nothing to hide is usually the answer that i get whereas the conversation could be a bit more positive and go, hey, um, you know, I read this thing the other day that that showed that, you know, as these companies are collecting data, like Google might pick up something about your, not through the speaker directly, but however, they pick up one piece of information. And this attacker, I read, took that piece of information, went and bought another piece of information from somewhere else, and then just look to the internet to find a third piece of information. And that the combination of those things was enough to take over that person's phone. And after they took over their phone, they drained their bank account. That's what happened. And that's it. That's all you need to say. You yeah. don't go, you don't go, oh, where have you given your information to? You don't need to go that far. Already, hopefully, that person is going. Yeah, holy crap, where have I given my date of birth to? Who knows my mother's maiden name, <laughs> right? Hopefully yeah, it's not right? that easy anymore. But um, but empathy is the biggest thing. And as we are not, as, as much as we like to pretend we are, we are simply not an essential service, right? Yes, we are, we are sort of essential to the, let's say businesses to businesses continuing to operate, but we are further down the list of priority and we need to accept that. So again, if we want to go to the example of, of making fridges, the people that they employ to actually put them together, the electricity to run the machinery, that is just as important to them. 
that's something that they could understand because that's, you know, everyone understands that, right? No power means machines don't go vroom vroom. And it, as we keep talking about security, I feel like that's where we need to keep talking about it at. It's like, this is just another one of those things that you probably do need to think about a little bit. It's not everything you need to think about, but we are here to support you. Except like, unless you're like the defense force, being secure mm. is not your primary objective. Yeah. Mm. Your primary mm. objective is to make fridges, is to provide financial services, is to bake bread, whatever it is, right? That's your primary objective. The reason why you have to worry about security is because it threatens your main objective, your main reason for doing that. And it's super important to always link it back to there. Having said that, I think it's the same on the opposite side. It's like, you need to have a bit more empathy on the opposite side and going, okay, well, you guys have obviously been doing this for a while. You know what you're doing. Let's put a bit of weight behind this and 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 see what happens. Yeah, let's not just take this at, at face value, but actually go back, talk about it, Let's have a think about what this actually means and make the best decisions, even if that mm. means we don't do anything with security. Okay. Yeah. That's, well, that's I mean, good. it's like if you're a, if you're like a two man company. I mean, if you've got MFA, why would you do anything else, right? It's like, oh heck, you know, if you don't really think that's important, then actually it, the, the the general idea that you know it's it's not actually relevant. You know, it is if you want to keep operating as a business, I guess. But it's it's like you know it's like IT, right? Mm. Technically, that's not really relevant. Um, I remember, uh, I don't know who told me this, but uh, that um, generally speaking, you know, businesses will see, and this is like looking at it from an operational perspective, but businesses will see uh, IT as a cost sector, right? There's a cost center to their business. It's a cost of doing business, right? Um, and that usually drives a certain view of, you know, IT as being something that's like an also ran and something we just kind of like deal with. Um IT, this, this person told me that IT should always try and uh, convey the message to the rest of business that they are an enabler, right? They have the ability to make the actual business do things better, make life easier, make things more effective, make them able to do more things. I think there is some capability for security to also fill that, you know, enabler sort of role, right? Now, we're not going to make life easier for people, but we're going to make life more safe. And we're going to make life, you know, more, um, you know, less problematic. You know, there's not going to be as many issues that are going to crop up. So, you know, I think a lot of the solutions that are currently being pushed are pushed from that perspective of you just need this, you need this, because otherwise your entire business is going to explode, right? Yeah. If you go to any any security conference and you listen to their sales talk, it's always here's how a company was totally destroyed in 15 minutes, and you're like, cool. Um, that's one way of looking at it, sure. But there's also the okay, well, single sign-on. Right, single sign-on with MFA or heck, uh, uh, things like YubiKeys, like FIDO compliance stuff. You don't need to remember your password anymore. You hate passwords. We know you hate passwords. Fine, right? You know, if you've got a Mac, for example, you've got a, like a modern phone. These things, you know, at least now are starting to become FIDO compliant. You log in using your touch, your fingerprint on your phone, you know, and that logs you into all of your apps, right? You're you're just logged in. It's fine. Right. We can make that work better. But at the same time, we can make that more, you know, efficient, more secure for the business. That's not just us throwing out some free stuff. That's us going, okay, let's build a way of doing this that's as seamless to the users and the actual business um, as possible, but also way more difficult for someone that is, you know, uh not uh you know authorized to break past. Um, you know, we we can we can provide visibility on actions happening inside the organization which, you know, great for security stuff and great for making sure people aren't, you know, doing the wrong thing. But it also lets us know where the problems are inside process, right? Why why are people going to certain things? Why are these people clicking on these things? Why are people trying to violate these certain policies? What about them is wrong? What about them is getting in the way of business? We actually have that information because we have information on everything that's done on a computer. So, you know, under the best circumstances, right? So we have this wealth of information and knowledge about what's actually going on in the business that we then use for an extremely narrow aim. That there is a broader thing that we can bring that is beyond just 
hey, we, you know, we're that group that you throw money at to keep hackers from getting in, right? We we can provide this information, this intelligence about what actually happens in the business that can be used for many other things than just stopping bad guys. Yeah, the cool. FIDO example is excellent because, mm. uh, you know, you hear everyone talking about this like security usability trade-off. Mm. FIDO keys and like UB keys and stuff is a perfect example of solutions that we should continue to, try and come up with of yeah it's more secure and it's more convenient right mm. in most cases you don't need to remember your password yet it's more secure because you don't need to remember your password mm. um it's yeah and so like middle I, I love middle ground solutions like this it's like if, if i can use the example of you know unfortunately like there's a there's a death toll on the roads and a lot of the recommendations, like in, if that was an issue in the security space, the recommendation would be stop using cars, <laughs> right? Um, but, oh but we don't want to do that, right? Cars are convenient. Generally speaking, they make our lives better. So finding a middle ground of like, look, there's no such thing as zero risk. There's no such thing as unhackable. So what? middle ground can we come to to say okay you as a business owner your business can sleep at night you're happy your clients are happy the people people's data that you store they're satisfied that you've done everything you can but remain operational remain doing what you do without it being super cumbersome cool thanks for that um we do have some questions for from the audience um might throw this one at you stefan uh, from McColl, thanks for that. How have you seen threats change since work from home has become more prevalent? And what are companies doing to protect people working from home? Oh, boy. Um, so it, it, it's interesting, right? The actual like threat types haven't really, you know, because there's only so many ways you can get into a thing. You've got to go through a person or you've got to go through the tech, right? Uh, but what's been really interesting is that the amount of human targeting has gone up dramatically, right? Because they know that generally speaking, if people are working from home, they're just kind of there by themselves, right? They don't have a group of people around them. They're less likely to ask questions about stuff. They're more likely to just try and figure it out themselves. Um, and they're also expecting their communications to come through via the computer. I mean, you know, uh, if you're at the office, you know, theoretically a pre-COVID environment, uh, you know, your boss can come walk past and be like, hey, or heck's working in the same sort of open office area and just goes, hey, have you guys been able to do X or hey, could you guys do this for me? But now it's going to come through as an email saying, hey, can you look at this document for me? Link, right? So people are basically being conditioned to click on links. Uh, but then we're also saying, don't do that because attackers are coming by and they're basically going, hi, I am boss because they've looked on LinkedIn and know who your reporting person is. And they just go, uh, can you just do X for me? And the funny bit is, is I was really excited at one point because, uh, you know, guys that work for us were like, hey, I've been getting phishing emails from someone pretending to be Stefan. And I'm like, yes, we've done it. We've made it. We're getting hit with uh, targeted phishing campaigns. Um, <laughs> but yeah, th this is the problem, right? This this stuff is is what's currently going on. Like the big target is don't worry about the tech, get into someone's laptop, get into someone's uh, cloud account, right? Uh, you can do that way easier because people are expecting email communication. So the the line of trust is much more blurry now. Um, now, in terms of what are people actually doing to protect people, uh, very often, not exactly much. Uh, there's this, there's, there's, uh, you know, never really been a, uh, a, a, a sort of a thought around how do we extend this sort of like barrier sort of castle approach to security beyond the office? Uh, one thing that's really being, you know, pushed or, you know, was being pushed, I still think it is, is zero trust in general. Oh, oh my God. I, I knew you were going to, don't say zero trust. I zero hate trust. Term. I hate that term. <laughs> what's, I love what's the zero concept. trust? Yeah, hate, it's like, I what's, love the concept. I hate the term. What, what, I, what I hate about <laughs> it, right, is that people say it and what they're dealing with is not zero trust. Right, because they're like, oh, it's, yeah. yeah, it's zero trust. No, no, it's... Yeah, it's still plugged into the authentication on your AD and just trusts all of your AD authentication because you use a single sign-on. I don't blame them. It's a stupid yeah. name. Yeah, no, yeah. it's 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 real tricky. But like, zero trust is like a theoretical approach to dealing with this, where like no system trusts any other part of the system, so you've constantly got to authenticate with it. Um, maybe the problem is is that if you own the user's laptop then you have access to everything the user knows, 
maybe not now, but when they type it in, sure. Um, and of course they have to use that laptop to interact with work because, you know, that's their right. only way of interacting with it at the moment. I might just so, butt in yeah. there, Stefan, just because uh, we're nudging up against time and oh, I want to squeeze please. another question in. Um, maybe this one for you initially, Alexi. Sure. Uh, what are your thoughts on the growing purple teaming movement? Is it just a fancy word for blue red team cooperation or are there bigger merits to really following a structured purple team methodology? The short answer is yes. It's a fancy <laughs> word for red blue team collaboration. So you ask 10 people what a purple team is, you're probably going to get nine different answers, but I'll, I'll give you mine. Um, in a purple team, you use the expertise of the other team as part of your um, your goals. So us as a red team, we would pull one of the blue team people into our red team and use their knowledge and their ideas for try to, to try and bypass security controls and stay under the radar. Similarly, the blue team would get a member of the red team in as part of them for this particular exercise and say, hey, I think the red team's going to do this. We should be looking in this area or we should be trying to detect these particular attacks that are most likely going to happen. That is generally what I think about when I think of purple mm. team. Yeah. Yeah. Pur purple teaming from over, you know, at least my land uh, is a really neat concept where it's basically what we expected red team and blue team to actually do. It's just now we're saying, oh, actually, no, they should talk to each other, not just via reports. They should just, they should actually talk to each other. Because I mean, from a blue team's perspective, knowing where the problems are in your network is a really handy way of actually building solutions to detect those vulnerabilities. Yeah. But like, you know, live, that, that's right? what- Not, not post-mortem, yeah. like live, yeah. It, it's, it's like, yeah, it's like, you know, you'd, you'd, you'd expect this to be happening anyway. It's just now that we've gone, ah, they should be talking to each other. What does that look like? Oh, it's a purple team. The concept is that they're one team. And it's like, should yeah. they have already been doing that? <laughs> thanks, guys. Um, that's a good answer. And sorry, thanks, Tara, for that question. Um, we do have a few more questions, but I think we've run out of time. I, just, uh, I know people have got to get back to work, so uh, we might might wrap it up there. I um, just want to thank you, uh, Lexi and Stefan, uh, for uh, being our experts today. My pleasure. Thanks for having me, guys. Yeah, it's awesome. Yeah. For the people we didn't get to, if you have any questions, chuck it into Hyperfire chat, I guess, or if it's like offensive security specific, feel free to ping me or, yeah, I don't know. Tim, I'll, I'll we'll all sort something out. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, we'll do. Thanks, everyone uh, in the audience for attending. Really appreciate you uh, giving us your time today, and thanks uh, for the people who asked questions. Um, if you want to find out more about any of the issues we were talking about today, or about Hyperfire or Volcus, uh, please check out our websites. Um, yeah, just do a search on Hyperfire or Volcus, and you'll find it. Um, have a great day, and stay fat, stay safe out there in uh, in the in Cyberland, guys. Thanks very much. We'll see you soon. Thanks, everyone.